and welcome back. I thought I should pick up some of the questions that you asked me on Instagram when I was doing all my lives. So in the last 10 days, I've done a live with Alexis Foreman. I've done two with the brilliant consultant dermatologist, Dr. Emma Wedgworth. I have done um, fun lives with people, with Wayne Goss, all since the lockdown, and they're all on uh, my Instagram or Wayne's or Alexis, or I've tried to keep as many as possible as IGTVs on my Instagram, follow me at Nadine Baggett. But sometimes when I show you the questions that come in, sometimes we just don't get round to them. So I thought I would just pick up some that are most common that most of you asked and see if I can help. So let's start. Um, Retinol. What's the difference between granactive retinol and retinol? Uh, the truth of the matter is, is granactive retinol isn't technically a retinol. Uh, it's a little bit like bacuchiol in the sense that um, it's something that has retinol-like properties within the skin, but a granactive retinol has additional molecules and add-ons put to it so that you get a much slower easier release into the skin. And experts are suggesting that granactive retinol is probably sitting at around a tenth of the strength of a retinol. So if you, for example, are using a granactive retinol at 5%, then you're probably getting 0.5% active equivalent of retinol. So be wary of trying granactive retinols. Brilliant if you're a first timer, brilliant if you've got super sensitive skin. However, they're not going to behave in the skin in the same way that retinol is. My opinion is you should start at a 0.3% retinol, work up to a 0.5% retinol, and then get to a 1% retinol. Most retinols at 1% are listed at 1%. Um, Paula's Choice is a perfect case in point. If you're going to buy one from a, a, a company like Estee Lauder or Origins, uh, Arden, the chances are it's going to be sitting at around 0.3% because the big companies don't want to risk irritating your skin and they want to err on the safe side. So they're good first step retinols for people to use. Is Bacuchiol as good as retinol? Bacuchiol is an antioxidant plant that has some retinol-like properties. Will it replace retinol? Does it work in the same way as retinol? No, 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 no. Please don't fall for the hype until it's been proven in a double blind trial, proper clinical trial, the way that retinol has. Personally, I will not believe the hype. The way that retinol works is it has a metabolic pathway in the skin. So retinoid is the generic term for all vitamin A derivatives that work within the skin. And they start off as things like uh, retinol, propionate, all those sort of retinol palmitates. And then basically they work their way up. They're converted in the skin through metabolic pathways to retinol, retinal, retinoic acid. So the closer you are to the active form in the skin, which is the retinoic acid, which you can only get on prescription, the stronger the action's going to be on your skin. The further down the metabolic pathway, the less strong they're going to be. And if you consider that what you're trying to do is get retinol into the skin, then why would you bother using a, ran a gran active that is a tenth of the strength of a retinol or a bacuchiol? My opinion might be controversial, but I think most of the big skincare companies agree that some of it's a bit marketing hype, I think. Uh, let's have a look. Perioral, perioral dermatitis. Help. I have a specific video for this because I suffer from perioral dermatitis. And when I spoke to Emma, Emma Wedgworth, she said, actually, if you leave it and it gets really bad, so by the time it starts going down here and down here and it becomes chronic, it often needs an oral antibiotic. I, however, keep mine in check with a topical antibiotic called Rosex Cream, which you can only get from your doctor on prescription. It's metronidazole, which actually is a mild antibiotic, but also has an anti-inflammatory action. All the perioral dermatitis is, is a breakdown of the barrier function of the skin. And then the normal bacteria, fungus, microbiome that sits on the skin gets off the surface of the skin and under the skin where it sets up an inflammatory reaction. And you'll know if you've got perioral dermatitis because it's never get pussy. What you get is these minuscule, minuscule pustule papules, papules I think um, Emma called them, which actually look like tiny little bubbles on the skin and they've just got the clear white blood cells in them. They, they don't, you don't have like a buildup of bacteria in them. So it doesn't actually turn into sort of sebum based pus or anything like that. Oh, sorry, that's my phone, let me turn that off. Um, so they pop up, they feel sort of rough, 
you know, you're hard not to scratch them off. They're quite stingy when they scratch off and they end up with this dry, horrible, red, flaky skin. It starts off around here. Normally it can go all the way around here. It's called perioral because it tends to be around the eyes, the nose and the mouth. You'll know if you see it. I'll put the link to my video down below. All skincare should be unscented. Stop all of the actives straight away. So it's most often caused by overuse of actives. So no scrubs, no acids, no retinols. Everything should be calming, soothing, cooling, unfragranced, and then get to your GP or your dermatologist and get some Rosex cream, Metro Nidazole cream. Don't get the gel. <laughs> The gel will have alcohol in it, which will further inflame the skin and dry the skin out because uh, the Metro gel is actually formulated for an oily acne skin type problem, not for perioral dermatitis. And don't put steroid cream on it. I know, I did it for years. I've made all these mistakes. Quite often a GP will say, oh yeah, that's all right. That looks like an inflammatory allergic reaction and prescribe a steroid. Steroid will knock it back for a few days and then it will bounce back and it will come back aggressively. So uh, yes, I'm afraid uh, so many of my followers have gone to their GP and said, well, Nadine says I should. And then the GP looks, and I'm like, really? What the hell does she know? I only know this not because I'm medically trained, but because I've been on this journey. I have suffered from perioral dermatitis on and off probably for about 20 years. So I made all the mistakes first. So you don't have to. Please keep nagging. You do need the Rosex cream. And if the Rosex cream doesn't work, you will need a topical antibiotic, uh, an oral antibiotic, sorry, a tablet. Uh, I'm going to put the link also to my Instagram TV with Dr. Emma Wedgworth, who is a consultant dermatologist below. And she, if you watch it, you'll also hear her advice, which is very similar to mine. Uh, actives before or after moisturizer. And by actives, we mean acids, we mean retinols, we mean vitamin Cs, we mean niacinamide, always before moisturize and one of the most common questions I get is how to layer skincare you go from the lightest formulation to the heaviest formulation from water to oil so essences hyaluronic acids antioxidants that are in a lightweight form like C ferulic timeless vitamin C all go on first then goes on your moisturizer oils always 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 come last because basically oil and water don't mix if you put an oil on your skin first whatever you put on top will just bead on the surface and won't properly go in over time it will go in but if you want a quick penetration before you put your makeup on go lightest to heaviest morning skincare routine it was very interesting because when i was talking to dr emma wedgworth about her morning skincare routine she said antioxidant spf foundation and I'm out the door. Mine would be um, uh, hyaluronic acid, antioxidant, both super watery. Then I would have a moisturizer with an SPF in or my foundation with my SPF in. Uh, at night, she would simply cleanse and then put on her retinol and then go to bed. For me, I would probably do cleanse hyaluronic acid and my retinol. Dr. Emma Wedgworth, however, was on prescription TRET, like most dermatologists, I'm just on 1% retinol. I use my retinol five nights a week, and then on the other two nights, I like to use an overnight peeling acid. Dr. Emma Wedgworth didn't use a peeling acid, but simply because her TRET, her prescription strength retinoic acid, is enough to exfoliate her skin more than effectively. Uh, how long should I use retinol for? Once you've started using it, if your skin likes it, why stop? You shouldn't need to stop using it in the summer because you should be using an SPF and you shouldn't be lying out in the sun anyway because using retinol and acids will sensitize your skin, in which case you will need to stay out of the sun because you can sensitize your skin. I think probably if you're used to using a TRET, a prescription retinoic acid, then you're gonna be on a high SPF. You won't be putting your face in the sun, so probably you will use it year round. Um, there's no reason, once you've built up a tolerance to prescription strength retinoic acid, to stop using it. It sounds crazy. I personally, um, use my retinol all year round. And actually, interestingly enough, you can see even though I've got a, a fairly heavily tinted moisturizer on at the moment, my face is still always whiter than my body. Uh, that's because I never put my face in the sun anymore. My 22 year old daughter is getting hyperpigmentation from acne help. Oh, the minute you start to get any redness or post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, as it's called, because it can either go red or it can go, um, if you are if you have pigmented skin, it can go darker brown, then the ingredient to look out for is tranexamic acid. The Inculus do a brilliant tranexamic acid, really reasonably priced. 
uh, SkinCeuticals do an amazing tranexamic acid product as well. So um, both of those work really well, but if you're on a budget, then the Inkey List uh, is the one to look out for. It's a relatively new ingredient. I would probably recommend use tranexamic in the morning and a really nice strong vitamin C at night. And uh, the Inkey List do both. They do tranexamic syrup and they do a C50 nighttime blemish treatment, which is salicylic acid and vitamin C at night. The combination are perfect for somebody like your daughter or a son, let's be honest here. Uh, explain peptides to me and are some better than others? Do you know this is interesting? I've asked a lot of people about peptides recently and dermatolo dermatologists are not really big fans. Um, I think they're something that you have in your everyday serum or your moisturizer. And I think they're a little bit of an investment that you put in your skin. They Peptides are, are simply broken down pieces of amino acids. That's the protein acids, the protein that make up your skin cells. And what happens is the, they they're broken up in a lab and when they land on your skin, your skin recognizes them at some level and thinks, oh, why is that cell damaged? Why is that only a part of the protein that skin needs? Why, why is it a little bit? And therefore what it does is it boosts its wound healing response. And as a result, it speeds up the metabolism of the skin. You're not going to see quick results from a peptide. I think use them now and your skin will thank you later a little bit like an SPF, but they're not as important as an FPF, SPF. I know what you're gonna ask me now. The next one is copper peptides. I've never noticed any big difference with copper peptides. I think you're much better off with the more traditional pentapeptides and hexapeptides. Um, they're all different types of peptides that are broken down when your skin cells are broken down. So they're parts of collagen and elastin, essentially the proteins that make up your skin. Uh, I never peel using retinol. Does it mean that my retinol is, isn't working? No, it doesn't. This is really interesting. Uh, everybody knows that if you use a pretty strong retinol, and certainly when you go to prescription strength Retin-A, that your skin could start to peel, probably will start to peel, but that's not a sign it's working. It's a sign that your skin is slowly getting used to it. If you're lucky and your skin never peels, if you've been really good and you've been buffering it with a really nice gentle cream, something like CeraVe, one of the hydrating creams, or La Roche-Posay Cicaplast Bone, uh, what else have I got here? Diprobase, something like that. Something that's just a really good, gentle emollient cream, then the chances are you're buffering it out and you're, you're gently delivering the retinol or the retinoic acid into your skin and you're not peeling Good on you. Um, uh, it will. It takes well over one percent for my skin to start to peel, uh, and normally my skin only peels with I think two over-the-counter retinols. Um, there's the Medicate uh, Crystal Retinol, uh, which is the next step up from uh, retinol, and then there's uh, the Neostrata one. They both make my skin peel. Everything else, I've never had a bad reaction to. If your skin does peel, by the way. Start to use niacinamide in your routine under the retinol, um, and then obviously buffer it out with creams as well. Niacinamide is a lovely B vitamin that helps protect your barrier function, and that's what retinol does. It has a tendency to slightly disrupt the barrier function to make your skin slightly more sensitive. But if you're not peeling, lucky you. I wish I was you. Uh, let's have a look what else we've got. Um, how do I shift acne scars? Uh, we were talking about this a lot with uh, Dr. Emma Wedgworth. Essentially, you're going to need a retinol product. Uh, if it's pigmented, then as I said, the tranexamic acid. But when all this is over, what you really need to do is go and see a GP, a specialist, a doctor, a dermatologist to get some sort of laser treatment. If the scars are indented, you can actually have a little bit of filler put in them. It's incredible. It's exactly the same filler that's put into the cheeks or the jawline. And then it literally goes into the dent and just pops it straight back out again. You can have micro needling as well. You can have it done professionally or you can do it at home. Uh, but that's going to be a lo long, slow, steady process like retinol. So the best thing to do is probably, if you can afford it, try and have a little bit of Frax or laser, which is essentially the laser equivalent of micro needling but imagine it on steroids. So you can do amazing thing with acne scars. If you look at some really famous people, aka Brad Pitt, and you look at what his skin was like when he was 20 and what his skin looks like now, he's 57 or 58. He, obviously he's aging beautifully, but his, acne, his pitted acne scars have virtually disappeared. That is simply good work by a dermatologist. So if you've come out the other side of acne and now you're thoroughly depressed because your skin is scarred, please don't 
panic. There are things that can be done, but you kind of do need to go and see an expert about it. And it's very interesting actually, because um, in the video, and I'll link it below, Dr. Emma Wedgworth, if you're in London, listed her three famous, favorite laser people as well. I put her on the spot, that was really interesting. Um, best way to keep dry skin young, moisturize, 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 moisturize. <laughs> What to look for in a moisturizer? You want three things in a moisturizer. You want humectants, that is molecules that bind water to the skin. You want emollients, that's, thing that's things that keep the surface layer um, flexible. So things like ceramides and glycerin. Glycerin is actually a humectant and, a, and an emollient as well. And then you want occlusives if your skin is super dry. And occlusives are things that sit on the surface of the skin. They don't really, in fact, they don't penetrate the skin at all. So things almost like paraffin, for example, and some silicon sit on the surface of the skin where they form a barrier between you and the outside world. Something like shea butter works perfectly. Um, I mean, if your skin's really dry, you could try coconut oil, but be careful because then it could occlude skin. And then what happens is the water simply can't leave. It's almost like a raincoat for your skin, but instead of stopping the water getting in, it stops the water getting out. It prevents something called transepidermal water loss. If you have dry skin, you essentially have a lack of sebum, and then sebum is what sits between your skin cells and makes it watertight, obviously. But at the end of the day, what you also have is too much water loss. So water is essentially... Um, disappearing from your skin cells almost like a roof with sort of broken tiles and what you need to do is try and trap water into the skin repair those cracks between those surface skin cells and if things are really bad then you actually just put a layer over the top and lock the water in something like uh, Diprobase and E45 are a combination of all three if you don't want to have to think about looking for active ingredients simply choose something that's formulated for dry skin that, I mean, they work um, and they're, they're clinically proven to work and they're often recommended for babies with dry skin conditions as well. It was very interesting that when I spoke to um, Dr. Emma Wedgworth about whether to use oil on dry skin, she said no. And I have to say, I'm not a fan of oils either. She said lots of clinical trials have been done and essentially uh, what they do is they use babies. So they're the perfect people to because they don't know what's being put on their skin at all. They're not aware of what's being put on their skin. And half of them were treated with oils and half of them were treated with a well-formulated moisturizer with those three things, the humectants, the emollients and the occlusives. And the, the, the babies that had the moisturizer, the well-formulated moisturizer, put on their skin had less recurrence, quickest recovery and less recurrence of dry skin in the long term. And I know that Diprobase has been tested like that. Essentially what you're doing is, is yes, oils can contain what your skin needs, but your skin basically has to send out enzymes to break down all those parts of that oil to take the ceramides and the fatty acids and all those things needed out of it. Whereas if you get a really well formulated cream, the cosmetic scientists, guess what? I've done all the hard work for you. Your skin doesn't have to work to take what it needs out of it. It can simply take them straight away at each individual layer of skin. Um, you know, I'm, I'm in awe of cosmetic scientists, so I'm obviously going to side with them in their argument here. Uh, should I wear a separate moisturizer or a moisturizer with an SPF? <laughs> and here's where Emma and I will slightly disagree. She says an SPF the whole way. She's a dermatologist. She uses one uh, every single day every day of the year in the UK, even though uh, most of the time the sun doesn't shine in the UK because she wants to protect her skin from UVA because UVA is constant throughout the year. That's the, the aging pigmentation um, uh, rays within the sun. UVB is more of the burning type, tanning type ray within, within the sunlight. You need to protect your skin from all of it. I, however, very rarely leave the house, probably for six months of the year. I'm on lockdown at the moment. I'm not leaving the house at all, apart from uh, three times a week to go for a nice long walk to keep myself sane. I personally use an SPF in my moisturiser and in my foundation. And I think most of the time that's enough to protect my skin. Now, bearing in mind, I've got 30 in my moisturiser and a 50 in my foundation. I simply need to, my, if I take my foundation down here, I simply need to remember, as you can see, look, see how much brown I am here should remember to put an SPF on here all year round. So it depends how determined you are to prevent the sun from getting to your skin. It's very interesting. I was uh, on Instagram the other day and there was a dermatologist there, in fact, a cosmetic surgeon, and uh, he was getting his, he was in based in LA and he was getting his 20 minutes of vitamin D and he was stripped to the waist in a pair of shorts. 
most cosmetic surgeons have got a huge ego. He was in good shape. Um, and he was saying that he had his SPF 50 on from here to here, and then nothing on his chest, his arms, and his legs, just for 20 minutes to get his vitamin D. However, we can all supplement vitamin D, and it's recommended. So I use the Deluxe Oral Spray anyway. Um, so uh, for me, I would just leave my arms and my legs uncovered, not my chest, not my face, anywhere that is constantly exposed and will show the signs of aging. Best age to start active ingredients, it depends on your skin type and your skin problems. If you have got acne in your teens, you need active ingredients. Obviously, you're going to need salicylic acid for sebaceous filaments and blackheads and open pores and all that sort of stuff. You can then go up to DUAC, which is benzyl peroxide and um, salicylic acid, or the one that um, uh, Dr. Emma Wedgworth mentioned, because DUAC is on prescription, is acne side in the UK, which is a benzyl peroxide, which you can then get over the counter. Um, if you've got pigmentation issues and you're in your 20s, there could be post-inflammatory, it could be a pigmentation issue because of the colour of your skin, then obviously you're going to need a vitamin C, maybe even a hydroquinone in your 20s. If you don't have any skin problems, simply treat your skin with respect. Nice, gentle, unscented, cleanse it every day, twice a day. Nice, gentle, unscented products. Don't spend an absolute fortune. The time to start thinking about actives is when you see the signs of aging, which for most people is probably in their mid to late 30s. And that's when you can think about introducing things like a gentle resurface surfacing acid, something like glycolic or lactic acid. I love lactic acid because my skin's getting drier as I get older, but also things like retinols and vitamin A's. And you can start with the gran actives and the bacuchiols and work your way up because by the time you're my age, you're in your mid to late 50s, really you should be using a fairly serious retinol or prescription strength retin-A. I've still not managed to burst through that barrier and stick with my Retin-A. It's sitting in my bedside cabinet and I must get back to it. I really, really, really must get back to it. Eye creams, are they worth spending money on or not? Uh, Dr. Emma Wedgworth agreed with me completely, only if they've got something that your everyday serum can't deliver to your face. I use my Retinol and my Vitamin C serum right up and round my eyes, but I'm fairly tough old bird, as I always say. If you can't bear to put your actives around your eyes because you're sensitive and a lot of people are, then obviously you get an eye cream with a, a gentle retinal delivery system or a lower level of vitamin C and they will be formulated to use specifically around the eye area and even on the eyelids. But don't feel like you have to if you don't have a specific problem. Sadly, there is nothing out there that can get rid of dark circles. We've talked about this a lot, it's just not gonna happen. You can get rid of puffiness with eye creams, uh, the Inculus Caffeine Serum is a perfect case in point. It's much nicer than the ordinary one, which is a serum. This is a gentle hydrating cream. But if, like me, it runs in your families and you've got the distended fat pad, um, then nothing's gonna get rid of that. That's the bad news. Neck creams is another thing that people ask for. Do you need a neck cream? I personally take all of my active ingredients down to here. Sometimes you have to be careful with retinols. The skin here is much finer. It's a little bit like the skin around the eyes. You have to be careful with high levels of actives, but I'm pretty tough. <laughs> I was putting, um, I've got an area of pigmentation here and a little spot here, and I put some Paula's Choice 2% BHA on this splash on, put my makeup on this morning. I thought, why is my makeup peeling off? And obviously the gel had formed over the skin and I had to ro roll it back off. I use my retinols all the way around my neck. Um, and I even used to use prescription strength Retin-A when I used it on my neck. And actually my neck didn't peel as much as my face, which I think is interesting. I think if, you, if you're worried about whatever part of your face is on show, People always ask me, I mean, my hands don't look good at the moment because obviously I don't have any nails because we're all short and neat and we're washing them too much. But actually the skin on my hands is pretty good for a woman of my age. And the only thing I can say is that everything I've ever put on my face, when it's left over, I put it on the back of my hands and that can be the only reason. When people say to me, do skincare products work? I always say, well, I can think of no other reason why my skin looks pretty good for being 57. I mean, the beauty industry, if you know how to maneuver your way through it and sort of sort the BS out and all those weird and wonderful miracle creams that are always out there that are promising to save the world, if you can actually sort your way through all of that, hopefully with the help of my YouTube channel, then there are key products that work. I'm going to list below both of the videos I did with Emma Wedgworth because I think they're really, really interesting. Any other questions you've got, ask below. And actually, I could do a Facebook Live with Emma Wedgworth and answer some more questions. I haven't actually done a Facebook Live, but if you'd like me to do a Facebook Live, then let me know. You know, I've been doing my normal Thursday and Sunday videos on Facebook, and then most of my other content goes on Instagram, so do try and follow me there. 
But actually, if you want me to try and get an expert on and do a Facebook Live, just let me know. Uh, this is going up on Sunday. The other thing that I will have done is on Saturday, and I will save it, I promise, as an IGTV. I will have done an IGTV Live with Jo Good, middle-aged minx. I absolutely adore her. I was on her radio show this morning talking about lockdown beauty. So I'm going to put the link to that down below as well. Thanks for watching, thanks for subscribing. I'm here to answer all of your skin and beauty questions. I might not be a medical expert, but I've spoken to a lot of them. I know what they're going to recommend for most people and I can try and help you navigate what works and what doesn't. Any other questions you want to ask, just let me know and let me know if you want me to do more. Ask me anything videos.